The John Morris Show, episode 65. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. You'll never have the sacred stone. <laughs> oh, this you crazy mother... You are now listening to The John Morris Show. My name is John Morris, Army veteran turned freelance web developer. And each week I bring you a fresh look into the latest news, advice, and next steps for the self-made web designer and developer to help you reach your dream of coding for a living faster. Thanks for giving me some of your time today. Now, let the episode begin. I'm super excited to say that this episode is sponsored by TopTal. Now, finding and hiring talented developers is really hard. Not to mention, after the large piles of resumes and profiles you have to sift through, once you find a reasonable candidate, it's difficult to evaluate a developer's skill unless you're a developer yourself. But TopTal makes it easy. TopTal is a large network of the top 3% of software developers in the world. And to be accepted, applicants go through a rigorous screening process that tests technical expertise, problem-solving ability, communication skills, and more. And the acceptance rate is just 3%. TopTal's team of engineers meets with you to understand your needs and handpicks just a few developers from their network for you according to your needs. Once you interview a developer, you can start working with them on a full-time, part-time, or hourly basis for as long as you need. It's very flexible. In fact, they've been so successful that they offer a no-risk trial period for all engagements. If you're not satisfied, you don't pay. And thousands of companies, including Airbnb, JP Morgan, Zendesk, and more, have turned to TopTal when they need developers because TopTal allowed them to hire rapidly, with confidence, and hire only the best. So go to johnmorrisonline.com slash TopTal, that's T-O-P-T-A-L, today to start working with top-tier developers. John Morris Show listeners will receive one week of TopTal development credit and a no-risk trial period for up to two weeks. So go to johnmorrisonline.com slash toptal now to sign up. Oh, and for all my developer friends, this is a network you want to be on. Forget having to compete with millions of other developers in those open networks. Get on TopTal and place yourself in the top 3% of software developers in the world, and let the projects come to you. You can visit johnmorrisonline.com slash toptal and click on the Apply as a Freelancer button to get started. Hey everybody, welcome back to the John Morris Show. Okay, now be honest. If you're listening to this right now, are you hating me right now? If you've been on my, if you're on my email list, then you know, you've seen it, you felt it. Things are a-changing around here. Here's, here's the question. Here's what I really want to get at. Do you want to be a full-time web developer or not? Now, if you don't, then get off my email list. Stop listening to the show. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a few of you who've contacted me who this is more of a hobby. That's fine, and you generally don't harass me. But all you out there that are really want to be a full-time web developer and you want to harass me constantly, get off my email list. Stop listening to the show. Because I don't believe you that you really want to be a full-time web developer. Really, you want to be a full-time web developer but complain about someone emailing you every day with relevant info to help you do that? Now, don't get me wrong. You can complain about the email and that was a bad email and I did a bad job of that particular email. Okay, I'll take that. But the people who say, oh, you e-, it's the fact that you email have started emailing every day. I mean, if someone came up to you and was like, you know, here's a free donut every day, or here's a free ice cream cone every day, would you be mad (laughs) that they did it every day? If it's something you want, then you don't have a problem getting it every day. So I, I, I don't buy that. Now, again, if the ice cream cone tastes like crap, well, then okay, say that. But... I don't, you don't even have to bother emailing me about the, oh, you email too much. Just unsubscribe 
Don't leave a comment. It's fine. I'm going to start emailing almost every day. I'm going to start focusing on giving you relevant information to help you become a full-time web developer, or if you already are, to help you advance your career. And I'm going to do it every single day. So if that's not what you want, then see you later. Because I'm getting serious about this and things are changing. I'm going to be much more assertive. And really, I want to, I want the off the fencers, the people who aren't serious, the people who don't really want this. I want you gone because you take up too much of my time. And I want to focus on the people who really want this. And so I know some of you probably listening here today who are on my email list are mad. That's fine. Bye. Now, for those of you who are left, I hate to be that way, but I've got to a point where I feel like I get dragged down too much by people who ha- just always have something negative to say. And you've probably noticed it in the shows. I kind of tend to reference it and talk about it. And maybe it's even a little like, really, dude, quit talking about all your so-called problems. But between Facebook messages, YouTube comments, Twitter messages, and emails, I probably get anywhere from 50 to 100 messages a day. And there's a good number of those who are those negative type emails that, oh, you send me too many emails. Okay, I don't need the email back. If it's too much for you, fine, just leave. But for the rest of you, for those of you who are serious, for those of you who want and need this information, then I'm working on stepping up my game. And like I said, if I send you an email or I do a podcast and you think it's cr- that particular one is crap, okay, so be it. I'll take that. But just the critique that you send too much email, it doesn't mean anything to me. To me, that says that you don't, you're not really serious about this. Now, I get everybody has things going on. That's fine. But <laughs> do you really want to be a full-time developer? or not. So, so everybody knows where I stand going forward. I'm going to be emailing almost every day. So, it is what it is at this point. All right. So that said, coming up on the show, got a number of things in store for you. First, uh, in the trend talking about different things that are going on in the community and so forth, Udemy actually just came out or Udemy just came out with a huge change, it was this morning, as of this recording, that they're going to be completely changing their pricing structure. And Udemy, or Udemy, has a ton of web development courses. Now, you know I promote these courses, so I'm interested in that way. But I'm also interested in the sense that there's a lot of developers who make their living not building things for people, but teaching courses. So if you're that person that has more of that that kind of teaching, you want to help others in that way type DNA, then Udemy is a good place to do that. And these this pricing structure change, <laughs> it's got a lot of people happy. It's also got a lot of people upset. And it's really going to change the way things are going on Udemy. It actually has me considering going forward with the releasing a course on Udemy. There are a lot of reasons why I haven't thus far. And the pricing and the way that the couponing and stuff worked was one of those reasons. And so these changes have me considering it, but it also, for you as someone who, you know, I promote these courses and you're, you know, looking at whether you want to invest in them, these changes are a big deal. And then for me as someone who promotes them, not just as an instructor, but as an affiliate, then uh, there's also some, some major changes there that affect it. So I'm going to get into that because I think it's it's something big that's happening in our industry that I want to talk about. In the mindset section, I'm going to probably tick a lot of you off, but I'm going to talk about or teach you why you should think like Trump. And so we'll get into that in the mindset section. Uh, also, we're going to be talking about getting hired by local businesses. 
and some things that you can do to make that easy for yourself. And then as always, obviously there's a lot more in the show and as always we'll have our Q&A of the week. Now if you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe over on iTunes at johnmorrisonline.com slash iTunes. That helps me move up in the rankings over there. It helps more people find the podcast and so forth. So I'd appreciate that if you'd subscribe over there. Plus, I'm going to be start releasing uh, what you would consider iTunes only. It won't be iTunes only, but it's it's going to be content that's not not on YouTube. So if you're listening to this on YouTube, uh, you may want to head on over to iTunes or SoundCloud or wherever and subscribe to the podcast there because I'm going to be releasing podcast only episodes. And so the only way that you're going to be able to get access to those is if you're subscribed on iTunes or SoundCloud or uh, essentially through uh, the the RSS stuff that, that all happens that way. So again, if you haven't yet, be sure to do that. JohnMorrisOnline.com slash uh, iTunes or JohnMorrisOnline.com slash SoundCloud. All right. So that'll wrap it up for the opening. Coming up next, we're going to get into the Udemy changing its pricing structure. You're listening to the John Morris Show on JohnMorrisOnline.com. Hey, everybody. As you probably know, I constantly harp on using content to help you grow your audience and build your credibility as a web developer. But your web presence is nothing without a great hosting provider. So if you haven't yet, get your website up and running with a fast, reliable, and well-supported web host, Bluehost, for less than six bucks a month. You can check it out and get Bluehost's best price over at johnmorrisonline.com slash bluehost. Welcome back to the John Morris Show and johnmorrisonline.com. So let's talk about Udemy's change in pricing structure. Now, if you're not familiar with Udemy and how it's worked in the past, previously, whenever an instructor created a course, they could price that course anywhere up to 300 from free all the way up to $300. And then they could offer, they could also create coupon codes that could discount the course at whatever percentage that, that, that they wanted to. And so what often happened is you would have instructors who would price the course at say the max price, which is $300. And then they would uh, wherever they did any of their selling of that course on their website, you know, if they ran a podcast, YouTube, whatever, they would give away huge discounts like 85, 90%. You, in fact, have probably seen me promote different courses where I've worked out deals with the instructor to get like 85% off the course, 80% off, 75, etc. And that was very, very common practice. In fact, Udemy itself did this all the time. You, again, have probably heard me or seen me promote the different promotions that they do where you can get courses for $10 or $15 or $20, whatever. And so the market, Udemy's marketplace really became a lot about the discount and the coupons. And it it really kind of led to uh, a few bad things. So the, the and, and the reason I want to talk about this is because Udemy is a huge marketplace in our industry and you know for those of you that are using those courses because I still even with some of the wonkiness with the pricing I still highly recommend a lot of their courses because the courses themselves are actually really really good some of the best courses that you'll find out there in fact you know this is the kind of thing that didn't exist when I was learning how to code and had it I'd be a heck of a lot further along because I could have bought a course for 15 or 20 bucks that would have taught me everything that took me four or five years to figure out on my own. So, you know, I, I recommend these courses constantly because they're such good courses, but the pricing of it was a little weird. And so if you're someone who's buying those courses, you, you know, I, I want to talk about this so that you know that going forward, it's going to be a lot more straightforward. But also, a lot of the courses on there are web development courses. And so this is one of the big ways that you can monetize your coding skills. In fact, this is the one of the ways that I talk about in my st seven strategies to turn your code into cash cheat sheet that's right on my homepage that you may have downloaded. So, uh, you know, it's it's a big change. It's something we should be paying attention to. And if you've kind of considered Udemy, I'll tell you why this makes me consider more heavily using Udemy as one of the ways of monetizing my skills. Because currently I don't have any courses on Udemy. 
but this makes me consider very heavily consider creating some for it. All right, so uh, what they or, or the problems that the old system led to was one, it was really confusing for students. You would see, you would go on there at different times. If there was a promotion going on, you would see some courses priced at three hundred dollars, and then you'd see others course at priced at nineteen, and it just. If, you, if you're someone who's new to Udemy or doesn't spend a lot of time on there, it can be really, really confused. Like, what is going Why is this course 300? Why is this 119, et cetera? And even though they generally did a good job of outlining that, you know, there was a promotion going on as a student, you know, you'd be wondering, well, why are not all of the courses a part of this promotion? And that's because they have to, you know, they, they have a way for instructors to opt out. And so... Not all instructors want to be a part of those promotions. And so it just cr- it created this huge disparity. You'd see a $300 course and a $19 course, and it just didn't make a ton of sense. And so when you're confused like that, what it automatically starts to do is you get skeptical and you don't trust the system. And Udemy has stats that they've outlined in some of the posts that they've made about this that show that most of the time what happens in those scenarios is those students just don't purchase any course. And so that's obviously a problem for a company whose business and instructors whose business is selling their courses. Plus, from the student's perspective, they're missing out for really what is a a technicality. It shouldn't be a roadblock. Uh, The other thing is that, and I know this is an affiliate, most students just don't pay more than $50 for a course. You know, instructors can get upset all they want about what they think their course is worth. But this is what I tell you guys all the time. The market determines what your course is worth. Now, yes, I get there's copywriting and all those things that you can do to up the value and so forth, but people will pay what they pay. And so for a lot of instructors, they don't want to spend all of their time becoming expert copywriters to be able to sell a a $1,000 course. They love to teach. And so they want to spend their time doing that. And so in that case, most people just don't spend over 50 bucks and that's what the market is. And so you have to, you know, to, to, to put a, cr- a price on a course at a price that nobody's going to buy just doesn't make any sense. Uh, and so, you know, it just it, it led to a lot of inconsistency and just weirdness. Uh, and so uh, as a result, what Udemy has done is they have set a cap for the price of a course at $50. So no instructor on any course on Udemy can charge more than $50 no matter what. So it's a hard limit and that's just gonna be the max price of the course. And then they've set uh, the max discount that they, Udemy can give or instructors can give is 50%. Uh, and so, and, and there's also actually, there's a minimum price too is of $20. So your, your course has to be at least $20 and can't be more than $50. So if you give have a $20 course and give the max discount, then you can still sell your course for $10 if you want to do that or Udemy wants to do that as part of their promotion and so forth. So you will still see that kind of thing, but it's going to be discounted from 50 not 200 or 300 or whatever. So it's just going to it's not going to have all that wonkiness with it. Now, why is this better? Why should you care? Well, for students it it just leads to more consistent pricing. You don't go on the site and see all these weird prices all over the place. And the pricing is consistent over time. I mean, the difference between a $50 course and a $20 course or discounted to $10 course isn't as dramatic or drastic as $310. So you're not going to, that's not necessarily something that you're going to hold out for uh, in order to get that, you know, 10 or 15 bucks. Maybe some people will, but if you really want a course, you're not going to you're not going to worry about the promotion. You're just going to buy it if you really want that course because the price is good enough. Um and so it'll it, it's just going to help with more consistent, less confusing pricing. Also, it helps build more trust because like I said, you don't have to worry about if if you're going to pay $200 for a course and then a week from now there's going to be a $10 promotion and you feel like a sucker because you overpaid for the course, which is again as an affiliate, I can tell you there's been people who've bought courses at full price, and as an affiliate, there's literally nothing I can do. I don't know who the person is. I, you know, I, there's no, I don't have an email. There's nothing I can do, so I can't tell somebody, hey, <laughs> you know, you could have got this discount. You know, I just literally have nothing I can do. 
But what would happen most of the time is people would buy those courses and then a week later they would refund it because they that may have been the first course they bought on Udemy and they realized, oh, I could have got that course for 10 bucks. So they refund it and then they just wait and then they buy the course, you know, maybe a month later when there's a, a, a discount. So it just, and, and when that happens, you know, you feel like a sucker and you don't trust the system and that's bad for everybody. So now that, that, that's going to be less of a concern because yeah, there'll still be promotions, but it's going to be the, the difference is less. You know, you know, if you miss a promotion, you might pay 10 bucks or 15 bucks more. That's not that big of a deal as it is paying 190 bucks more. So it's just going to be better for students and it's just more honest. I mean, uh, most, are, are you really, is your pricing really honest if you price it at 300, but sell most of your courses at 10 or 15 bucks? Not really. I mean, you could pretend like it is to be kind of self-righteous, but not really. So it's just a more honest system. Now it's going to be better for instructors. And this is kind of why I'm considering putting a course on there because most instructors already sold the bulk of their courses during the promotions. And so that puts you at the mercy of Udemy and the promotions that they're doing. And again, it leads to a situation where, you know, you're kind of devaluing your course in a way. If you're saying it's 300, but you're always selling it to people for 20 or 30, then, you know, again, it's not really being upfront and honest about your pricing. I get it's a strategy, but you can't argue that that strategy is more trustworthy. It works, but it's not necessarily a trust-inducing strategy. So um, it's just going to make it, it's going to force instructors or, or allow instructors to be able to still compete while being more honest about the price of their course. Also, most instructors, their average dollars per sale already was $10, $15, $20. So even if you price your course at $300, you never sold it for that price. And most of the instructors that are being honest about this in the comments for all this on Facebook and everywhere, admit that. They can, you can go back and look at the average uh, price that your courses for each course were sold for. Most of them are saying, well, it was $11, it was $12, this, that, the other. So, uh, again, it, it, it allows you, you know, uh, to, to just be more honest about it. And Udemy believes, based off all of their data analysis and so forth, so forth that that's aver- that average per sale is actually going to go up because they're not going to be doing as many of the in fact, they're not going to be doing $10 promotions anymore. I know that. I've got a notice about that. They may be doing some $15 promotions, but the since the app since instructors aren't having to discount their prices uh in order to compete with every Here's the thing that happens. One course does that. It's priced at 300 and they discount it to 30. Then the whole category has to do that. Because otherwise you can't compete. So, this is going to kind of level the playing field in a way where you don't you don't feel like you have to do that. You know, a course can can sell for max of $50 and maybe it's discounted to 25. But if you're the guy that's or the gal that's marked at 30 or 35, it it's not that big of a thing that you can't make it up by having a better course. And so uh Udemy believes that it's actually going to raise the average dollars per sale. Now we'll see if that pans out, but uh, given the logic that they've laid out, I kind of, I tend to agree, but we'll see. And then again, for instructors, just students are just going to trust the overall system more. And so they're just more likely to buy courses and that's better for everybody. Now for me as an affiliate or for other affiliates out there, if you're thinking about do, becoming an affiliate of you to me, you know, I know and I'm sure most affiliates would agree, you pretty much never sold a course above $50 anyway. And most of the courses that were two and $300, uh, if they sold at that price, got refunded. Every time I saw one, I knew I, in my head, I thought, well, that's going to be refunded in a week or so. And so you just never sold them above $50. So it really doesn't mean anything to me in, in terms of that. And, you know, There were lots of courses. This is the biggest one for me. There were tons of courses that were priced at $200 and $300 with no discounts. And those were just simply out of range for for my audience. 
Dude, my audience just won't pay. Like Udemy says, they just won't pay above 50 bucks. So they're just, those prices were just off limits. There's one I can think of specifically in my head that I would love to recommend to you guys over and over and over and constantly because it's a great course, but it was priced out of range and offered no discounts. So this was going to bring those courses down to a level where they're within range for my audience. Being able to get that course that I'm thinking of, I'm not mentioning it because you can't get it yet. And (laughs) trust me, when the price comes down, you'll hear about it. But having that down at $50, now you can afford it. And it's a great course. Getting that course at that price is a steal. So um, I'm excited about that part of it. And the other thing is, is then as an affiliate, I'll be less tied to promotions and instructor coupons. And I can focus more on putting the best courses in front of the right people, which is what I've wanted to do. But it's very, very difficult when you have courses that are out of the price range or you have to constantly try and work with instructors to get coupons to bring them down to a price that you know your audience will actually pay for them. This is This has been the thing that I constantly battle with is trying to explain to instructors that Nobody's going to pay $200 for their course. It's just not going to happen. I will sell none of those. And getting them to, now I don't have to worry about it. The max they're going to be is $50, even if they don't offer a coupon code. So what? It's still a great price for the course. So now I can focus on just finding the best courses and putting them in front of people, not the best courses that I can get a coupon code for. So... Uh, I'm really, really excited about this and it has me considering releasing a course on there because then I can actually compete because I don't want to do all that other stuff that a lot of instructors were doing in order to sell their courses. I want to just be able to focus on the content, offer it at a reasonable price, and then, you know, put it in front of the right people who would benefit most from it. So, um, I think this, this, this pricing structure is going to have a huge effect. I, I, I'm thinking it's going to be a positive effect. I understand exactly why they're doing it. It's been a lot of my own frustrations as an affiliate and what has really kept me from putting a course on there as an instructor. So big, big, big changes coming. If it's something you've considered doing, whether buying a course or putting one of creating a course and putting it on there, then these changes should be exciting for you. All right, coming up next, we're going to get into thinking like the Donald. So why I think you should like uh, think like Trump. And it's probably not what you might be thinking right now. So before you actually send me your hate mail, go ahead and listen to the segment so you actually know what I'm saying. Uh, but that's coming up in the next segment. You're listening to the John Morris Show on johnmorrisonline.com. Today's episode is brought to you by the Complete Web Developer Course by Rob Percival on udemy.com, where you can learn HTML, CSS, JavaScript, PHP, MySQL, WordPress, mobile apps, and more inside one convenient course, so you can shortcut the time it takes to start earning your full-time income as a web developer. John Morris Show listeners can get an exclusive 85% discount on the course by visiting johnmorrisonline.com slash cwdc. That's johnmorrisonline.com slash cwdc. Welcome back to the John Morris Show on johnmorrisonline.com. All right, we're going to get into the Donald. Now, I can already, I posted, uh, was probably a couple weeks ago, I had had an account the, whose name was Donald J. Trump follow me on Medium. Now, I am pretty confident, I mean, 99.9% confident that this was a fake account. In fact, my little brother got followed by the same account. So there's certainly nothing, I don't think this was actually Donald Trump, or if it was, he's just out there following a bunch of different people for no reason. But I thought it was funny to have a, a... message in my email box that said you've been followed on medium by donald trump i just thought it was funny so i took a picture of it and i posted on instagram you may have seen that you know it goes to facebook and twitter and so forth and it didn't take but three seconds and i had somebody 
on my Facebook who went off on this rant about Trump and (laughs) comparing him to Hitler and all this stuff. And look, I get people, you know, I run a political podcast, so don't get me wrong. I'm opinionated about politics, but it just people don't even listen. You you know, they just see something and they just react to it. I saw this one. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to talk about this for a minute because (laughs) I just thought I thought this was crazy. I saw this one and it's of this this picture, this guy sitting in a chair in like a lawn chair at some sort of rally or something. And he's holding these two signs. And the one sign has a picture. It's like a picture of Donald Trump. This is all cartoonish. uh, And it's like a sketch. It's like an outline. It's not like a full picture. But it's of Donald Trump. It's like this cartoon of Donald Trump. But he has like a little Hitler mustache. And it says something like no more Mexicans on the sign. And then the other side of it is the, the Trump name with like a, a big T and the, it was designed in such a way. So if you stood back from it far enough, it looked like the s- shape of a swastika. Now the person who posted it that where I saw it was posting it and insinuating. And I think a lot of people were doing this, that this was a Trump supporter. And this was the kind of stuff that they were carrying around and doing. And I was like, okay, yeah, that's a little crazy. I mean, you know, Hitler and a swast that's not stuff to to support or be proud of or like 100,000% against that. But I'm like, I always know that there's, it always feels like when I see those things that there's something fishy about it. So I actually went and looked it up and it took me all of about 30 seconds to find that this was actually not a Trump supporter. It was someone who was anti-Trump. And they had created these signs and were out were outside of a polling place in Texas for Ted in Houston for Ted Cruz and had put was carrying around the sign and had put up the the one sign. And they were saying that Donald Trump was like Hitler. Like they were making that accusation of him and that the one with the little swastika that had the Trump, it had Trump's name with big T's. You have to, you'd have to see it the way it was shaped, but below it, which is something you couldn't see on the other photo, it said stop. So it was basically saying stop Trump. <laughs> so it, and again, it took me all of about 30 seconds. So of course I posted the link and was like, look, I mean, look, there's plenty to critique about the guy, but let's, <laughs> let's at least be honest about it. So all that to say, I know that I'm probably kicking the hornet's nest here a little bit. But I do think that there is a lot that you can learn from Donald Trump. Now, why is that? The first and foremost is you have to be able to step outside of your immediate reaction and feelings and and just put the, the political stuff si- aside for a second and look at what's actually happening. And recognize and be able to glean, this is what I talk about all the time, glean the things that are valuable from every situation you encounter, including Donald Trump. So think about think about this guy for a second. When he announced that he was, you remember uh, 2012 when he, he was dabbling with running for president? I mean, he got lampooned. Everybody was making fun of him, both sides of the aisles. And when he announced this time, Everybody was making fun of him. Nobody gave him a chance of even co- being competitive in the Republican uh, nomination, or the Republican primary. And now look, he's almost certainly going to be the Republican nominee, and many think that he's going to be president. In fact, I was watching, I always flip between Fox, CNN, and MSNBC so I can kind of see everything. And yesterday here in the United States, or well, it depends when you're listening to this, but a couple days ago, uh, Tuesday was Super Tuesday. And so there's a lot of coverage on. I was watching CNN and Van Jones, who is you know, kind of a hardcore Democrat and generally likes to make fun of Republicans and has been kind of making fun of Trump, said, look, Democrats need to like we need to wake up when it comes to Donald Trump, because this isn't this isn't funny anymore. It's not a joke. Like. 
If he can do this to the Republican Party, he can absolutely do this, the same thing in a general election. How he's just blown the entire, (laughs) your entire paradigm of politics. And I'm someone who follows politics and it just, the guy doesn't make any sense when it comes to politics. Now, you can say, I know the people don't like him. I already think this. Well, his, his supporters are just dumb. It's too easy. It's too easy to say that. And I know a lot of really smart people who are supporting him. So you can't just... People who are well-informed. People who... Most of the people who call them dumb, if they got into a debate, the people supporting him who I know that are well-informed would run circles around those other people. So it's just too easy to say, well, it's just because he, he, low information voters and they're too stupid. There, I'm sure there's some of that, but there was plenty of that uh, with Obama too. I mean, that that's every candidate has that. But there's there's something else. It's just too easy. And so it got me thinking like, what what is it about him? What What is it that why he can, you know, he he says crazy things. He does. He says things that I'm like, what is he doing? And everybody thinks that it's going to hurt him, and it doesn't. And not only does it not hurt him, but the more people attack him, it seems like the more support he gains. He not only deflects it, he actually gains support. And when you look at him, he's the complete opposite of what we think a politician has to be in order to win an election. And so, again, I was just like, what is it about this guy that people like? I don't, I don't quite understand. Because, I, I mean, I'm a libertarian. There's not a lot, you know, I, I know he says he's a Republican. <laughs> there's not a lot that I agree with him on. Okay, there's a lot of things that I have a lot of serious issues policy-wise. Now, I can kind of chuckle a little bit at the spectacle and what he's done to the media. I, 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 I do. I, I think that's kind of funny. But... You know, there's the policy wise, there's not a ton I would agree with him on, but still you have, you can't, you can't look at this and, and, and marvel and wonder what it is. And so I've been something I've been thinking about a lot. And then John Oliver, who is former used to work with John Stewart does last week tonight, again, somebody who I wouldn't agree with on a lot of things, but I do watch his show periodically. He did a piece on Trump and he was asking the same question. So I was like, okay, this, let me see what he's got to say. And I thought what he said made a ton of sense. It's all about Trump's brand. Because if you think about, and I can, I know I can say this, and I think if people are honest, even the people that cannot stand him, if you're honest and you think about Trump, before you, before he ever really started talking about politics, before, you know, this year before he got in, or even 2012 when he was commenting and he did, was doing some of that stupid birther stuff and so forth. Before that, when you heard the name Donald Trump, you thought of successful businessman, someone who was rich. There was a certain element of respect to his brand. And it's that brand that has really kind of carried him through and and been what he's leaned on and he's leveraged. And if you listen to some of his supporters and talk about him, that's what they say. They'll say, well, it's Trump. I mean, it's Donald Trump. And then they'll say things like, he's a successful businessman. He's, you know, he's a billionaire. He's, he's run successful businesses so he can run our, you hear all these things, which again, you can disagree with, but that's why, that's why those people are supporting him. Um, the fact that he is not ashamed of being rich and says it, which, you know, for a lot of people, I might put myself in this category in in this country if you know it's 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 almost become taboo to be someone who's successful and wealthy. You're not supposed to want that anymore apparently. So there's a lot there that's associated with his name. Not only being successful and being rich, but not being ashamed of it. I think that's the one that really pushes people over the top. And here's the thing. That brand, he did that. He built that very, very specifically. And he's leveraged his brand for millions and maybe even, it's speculatory, I think, but even billions of dollars. And everybody calls, this is one of the things that John Oliver pointed out. 
you know, he's, he calls himself a builder, but he actually rarely builds anything. Instead, other people build it and basically license from him putting his name on it. So a lot of the Trump Towers and the Trump this and that that you see, he didn't actually build those, right? He, Other people wanted to build him and then want, but wanted his name on it because of the power of his brand. And so that that's <laughs> that's what he's done is he's built it to the point where he can just put his name on something, his last name on something and be paid in order to do that because it actually works. Like those people wouldn't ask to have his name put on it if it didn't work for them to 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 get people to go to their hotel or casino or whatever it is. And so he's leveraged millions and millions, maybe even billions off of the power of his brand. And now all he's doing is leveraging that same brand to become president. And so that's why the more you attack him, it it goes back, uh, I've read this once, that when someone believes something passionately, the more you tell them that they're wrong, the more they're going to believe it. Because it, it it's the if they in order for them to give up that belief that they hold on to so dearly, it would undermine and and uh, it would undermine everything that they believe, and so it would just rock them to the core, and so. Uh, they wouldn't know what to do. And so they would rather hold on to an idea that's not true to keep mentally sane than to seek the truth and risk kind of going crazy a little bit. So that's why every time people attack him, his support grows, his base gets more passionate because they so strongly want to believe that he's the guy that's going to fight for them and fix what they see is wrong with the country and so forth that every time he gets attacked they it just furthers their their belief in him so that's very very powerful <laughs> that's it's eerily powerful and this is the kind of thing the reason i bring all this up is that this is the kind of thing that we can leverage on a smaller, less eerie scale in our businesses. And so what this means is that building your brand, and I've talked about this before, but building your brand is the single most important thing that you can do to be successful in business. And here's why. It energizes all everything else you do. You know, if you're someone who... Uh, has studied marketing a lot and you're a direct response person, this energizes all of the direct response you do. Think about it. What people forget is context, right? If you create an ad on Google for a search that someone does and you point them to a sales letter of yours that sells them a product and they know nothing about you before that, there's no context there. And so all the stuff that that most direct marketers talk about in terms of direct response and so forth applies because there's no context. They know nothing about you. And so it all comes down to how well you can write your sales copy. But most of us, that's not the, the, the situation in which we find ourselves. Instead, there is, with the way that social has just changed the internet, there's always context or context that can be easily found. So someone can do a Google search for you. And if they don't find you, that's actually context. <laughs> that's actually a, a mark against you. And so context is what they already know about you and what relationship they have with you when they show up on your sales page. If you do a good job of setting context, then they show up on your sales page already trusting you. And if they show up on your sales page already trusting you, your sales copy becomes far less important. I mean, yeah, you still have to do the fundamentals and, and make sure you give them all the information, but it's not the same. The context is different. And so your brand is that context. It's the summation of what other people know about you, the, the, the relationship that they have with you. That's your brand. And so it energizes everything that you do. And it's what can make people trust you implicitly when they show. So when they go to your services page to hire you, have they watched 
YouTube videos from you before? Have they communicated with you on Twitter or Facebook? Have you know they communicated with you via video? Have they read articles? What do they know about you when they show up on your services page? And do they trust you? And so your brand, this is why we say band-aids instead of adhesive bandages. I, I mean, you might not even know. I, until I looked into this, I didn't even realize it. Band-aids is not what that thing is called. It's an adhesive bandage. Band-aids are a brand. But I know at least here in the United States, whenever I need an adhesive bandage, I say I need a band-aid. Now, you know, the person who goes and buys them may buy a generic or a different brand or whatever, but I say I need a band-aid. Well, that's the brand. That's why we say Band-Aid instead of adhesive bandages. Because they've done such a good job of branding. They are the category. So, the question is, how do you do this? Well, there's two things that you need to keep in mind. There's two pieces to your brand. Two macro pieces to your brand or your fame or whatever. And that is reach and influence. So, it's how big of an audience do you have, the actual number of people listening to you. That's the first thing. And then B, how much influence do you have with them? How well will they listen to you? The more people that you can have as an audience or the bigger your audience, the more reach you have and the more influence you have with them, the stronger your brand will be. And so there's many approaches to doing this. Now, the approach I prefer I would probably not be considered the Trump approach, but it's the approach of helping others. That's why I do these podcasts. That's why I have all the tutorials on my site. That's why I have all the articles and so forth on my blog. Because as you go through all of that, it helps build context, helps you to understand me, and hopefully you trust me so that when you go to a services page, if you're someone that looks to hire me, the sales page is, you're just looking for the contact form. You know, it's it's not really, (laughs) you're not really being sold by the sales page. You're already sold. Or when I recommend a certain course, you trust what I'm saying, that I'm pointing you in the right direction. It's all about trust. Now, you may not, again, Thinking like Trump may not be something that you could ever convince yourself to do, but there is another guy who I think you could, and his name is Gary Vaynerchuk. And this is a guy, you probably heard of him. If not, you can Google him and very, very quickly get to know him. And he's a guy who takes that same approach and and is really where I've kind of developed and molded my approach. And he's all about helping others to create context. and. If you want to learn his method, which I've done, I've been through, I highly, highly recommend, he actually does have a Udemy course that you can take. So I'm not going to sit here and pitch you on the course or anything like that, but it's a very great course that's going to teach you all about personal branding and and personal branding by helping other people. That's the mindset to, that's what I really want you to get, is that you can help others and build your brand to help you make more money. I mean, who wouldn't want that? So you can go over to johnmorrisonline.com slash Gary, G-A-R-Y. Um, that is an affiliate link, so I'll earn a small commission. But uh, again, that's not why I'm recommending it. There's plenty of courses out there uh, that I could recommend. I'm picking this one specifically because I think personal branding is so important. And Gary Vaynerchuk is the guy to teach you the method that I recommend, which is Again, building your brand by helping other people. So johnmorrisonline.com slash Gary, you can see that course. And if you want to uh, invest in that course, then then so be it. But regardless, focus on helping others. Know who your ideal client is and then create things that will help them and build trust for you so that when they need someone, when they need to hire someone, you're the one they look to hire. All right, coming up next... In the show, we're going to be getting into creating stunning business cards with some templates that I found that I think you're really going to like. In fact, I sent this out on my email list a few days ago, 
and have gotten a ton of responses, thank yous, and this is awesome, and so forth. So I wanted to make sure and talk about it on the show, and I'm actually going to walk through kind of using one of these and show you just how simple and powerful this is. So that's what's coming up next. You're listening to John Morris Show on johnmorrisonline.com. So I just realized something. I'm always harping on how important creating blog content is for getting new clients to your web design business. But what if you don't have a blog and you're not sure how to get one set up? Well, don't worry because I've just created a new tutorial on how to start your blog in less than 15 minutes. So in less than 15 minutes from now, you could have your blog up and running and creating content that's going to help you attract new clients for your web design business. In order to take this tutorial, you want to head on over to johnsbloggingtutorial.com. Again, that's johnsbloggingtutorial.com. Head on over and let's get your blog started today. Welcome back to the John Morris Show, johnmorrisonline.com. This segment, I'm going to be talking about how to create some really stunning looking business cards using some templates I found. Now, if you're on my mailing list, then I emailed this out earlier in the week. You've probably seen these. Now I'm going to show you how to actually go through and use these. And I, you know, I I came across this because I recently did this for a client of mine. They had run out of business cards. They said they needed some more and they were kind of wanting a new design. So I was doing some looking around and lo and behold, here's the site with you know, 50 plus different business card templates. And most of these are really awesome looking and something that most clients would be absolutely thrilled with. And they're really, really simple to use. So I'm going to just show you how to use these real quick. So the URLs up here, designcraze.org slash free PSD business card templates. Obviously, if you want the easy link, you can go on to johnmorrisonline.com slash 65, and I will have the link to these templates over there. So the first thing to do, obviously, once you arrive here is just to kind of go through these and pick out the the one that you want. So you can kind of look through and see which ones you like, which ones you think uh, your client might like, and and maybe come up with if you're doing this for a client, maybe come up with four or five of these that you think might be good options for your client, and then present them to your client. They don't take long to make, so you know it it, it wouldn't take you long, maybe an hour, to set up four or five of these to then really blow your client away with the different options you have. Now, I actually I did go through all these, but I really for this client I really liked this first one right up here. And the main reason why is because the colors, the green doesn't, but the the grays and stuff and just the kind of overall look and feel really matches their website. And so uh, all I knew, I knew all I'd have to do is kind of change the color there. There's just more of an orange color. I'd have to just change that, the the information and then drop their logo in there. And so, and it would fit really, really well with their overall design. So this is the one I actually picked for that client. You just hit download and it'll ask you to download the template. Now I've already done that. So once you download it, then you can uh, extract it and you'll be given something that looks like this. And so we'll just start off with opening up the front and it's gonna ask you about some different fonts. And so this uses the uh, Roboto condensed font. Now, I have Roboto installed. Um, I guess I don't have Roboto condensed. So I just hit don't resolve. And I'll show you why here in just a second. Because um, if you resolve it, it's just going to change all of them to Myriad Pro since it can't find Roboto. So um, I'll show you how to deal with that here in a second. So the first thing you're going to notice is it has this little layer over the top that says PSD freebies. Now, you can very easily get rid of that. That's this layer right here. So you just turn that off, and now you have access to the actual design. And so you know, the first thing that you're probably going to want to do is you have this logo up here, and this element right here is the actual logo. So like I did, I have my logo that I made up for my client that I just brought over and dragged and dropped in here. You can kind of, you know, whatever you have for your logo for that client or if they can send you a logo that they have and then you can kind of drop it in here. The biggest things I wanted to change were first off the colors. So I just kind of came through and we have this body copy here. I just go to color overlay 
and this is it actually still has the orange in here that I use for clients so I just hit okay on that orange color do the same thing for the color overlay here and you can see it's now kind of starting to gather, come together with their colors then we just kind of go through each section here so you have the name the address the phone number the web and email you can change the background colors if you want I didn't because they match really well with their website design so we drop into name here again these two sh the shapes down here are this little thing over here so you can just do a color overlay and change it to this orange color and now you have that changed out for the actual web designer text this is where it's going to ask you to do the font substitution so it's going to change it to myriad pro now i have roboto so if i just type in roboto and then regular then i get roboto back and then i just came over here and i just condensed it myself down i think two to like negative 40 uh, in the character kind of uh, section here so you can see and then actually we'll change the color We'll take this color and we'll grab this. And now we've changed the text color. Okay, so you can see it's it's really pretty straightforward to come in here and change this out. And then the other one is, actually I think, if we come over to web and email, there's, um, a shape in here for changing this bottom color down here. I have to click this back on. Uh, maybe it's not in there. Okay, so I <laughs> had to find it because it was it's in a weird spot. So it's actually, if you look here in logo top, this bottom copy three, that's where it is. So you can just do the color overlay on that and change that color as well. So again, that's all I did is I just come through each one of these, the name, and you can find the shape in here and oh, actually I already did the name you can do the address find the shape uh, do color overlay and then just change all the colors to whatever your clients color pa palette happens to be and then of course you can just come through here and change all of the different copy that's in here it's gonna ask you for the if you don't have that font it's gonna ask you for the substitution every time um, Again, I just go with Roboto regular, and then I kind of condense it myself a little bit like that. So pretty straightforward to come through here and edit this up, and it, it, it creates a really, really nice-looking business card that I think most clients would be absolutely ecstatic with. Now, the other side, of course, you have the back on here. You can open this up. It's the same deal. You kind of un, you hide that layer to get rid of their, their little branding and stuff. And then this one's even easier because uh, you don't have all the groups and stuff. So you can really, really easily come in here and do the color overlays. You can drop in your logo for your client. Come down here and change the URL. And you're good to go. You know, it's it really, really simple. And so, again, just... This is one of the things that you don't always have, this stuff doesn't always have to be hard. You don't have to come up with this stuff all on your own. You don't have to, to think of it all on your own. You can use stuff that's out there. And if you come back over here, I mean, there's tons and tons of really good. I mean, this one looks really good. You know, these are good. I mean, even the all of these are really, really good business cards that, again, I think most clients would be absolutely ecstatic with and they're really really simple for you to to edit and use so um, very very valuable resource I think I'm probably gonna come over here and just download all 50 and put them into a folder so that I have them all um, and then that way I don't have to kind of hope that they stay up here on this website or constantly come back to remember the URL every time I need to uh, use one I can just I just have them downloaded and I can use them whenever I want. So very, very handy resource. That's how to use it to create business cards. This is something you can use for yourself. I'm actually making my own business cards based off of this or, you know, for clients. And, you know, it's just something that's really simple that you could get paid to do for clients and give them something that looks really awesome. So that is how to use these business card sets. Coming up next in 
our freelance segment. We're going to kind of piggyback off of this and talk about marketing or getting hired by local businesses. This is one of the many simple things that you can do in order to get yourself hired and use your coding and web development and design skills in working with the local businesses and really uh, be able to kind of undercut the competition in a sense that if you're someone who's been primarily working online, you are probably light years ahead of the other developers in your area who have catered primarily to local businesses. Uh, if you go and look, just just do it. Do a little search of the biz, local businesses or the, the web designers in your local area who are catering to local businesses and see what they can do. Chances are you'll look at it and go, wow, okay, I could, I could do that. I could, I could out-compete that in terms of design and so forth. So it's a huge, huge opportunity, and there's a lot of local businesses that really need that kind of thing. So I'm going to be talking about some things that you can do to get business and help people in your local area that are very, very simple and basic. You're listening to John Morris Show, johnmorrisonline.com. John Morris here for the Complete Web Developer Course by Rob Percival on Udemy.com. Now here's the deal with this. Do you ever get frustrated constantly searching the internet for tutorials to learn how to code? Are you worried that learning how to code is taking longer than it should? Do you just wish you could learn everything in one convenient place so you can get on with earning your living as a web developer? Well, that is exactly why Rob created the Complete Web Developer Course. Everything you need to know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, jQuery, PHP, MySQL, WordPress, APIs, and mobile apps in one convenient course. And you know it works because Rob has over 183,000 students and the most five-star ratings of any course on Udemy. Now, here's the best part. John Morris Show listeners can get an exclusive, and this is just for you guys only, an exclusive 85% discount on the course simply by visiting johnmorrisonline.com slash cwdc. So look, quit pulling your hair out trying to find good tutorials on the web. Do the smart thing and hit up my man Rob's complete web developer course with the slick 85% discount right now. Visit johnmorrisonline.com slash cwdc and you'll be all set. Welcome back to the John Morris Show, johnmorrisonline.com. This segment, we're going to get into getting hired by local businesses. Now, I wanted to talk about this because I think this is one of the most overlooked things for developers, and that's we tend to underestimate just how much business there is sitting right around us. And I've started doing some of this with some businesses around where I live, and it's absolutely incredible just how much is out there. And so the the big idea here is that if you take your average online business owner and your average local business owner, the discrepancy in how much those two people will know about the internet is is, is very vast. Your average online business owner will actually know a decent amount. Even the ones that if you've had clients and you're like, oh my gosh, these people know nothing, your average local business owner will probably know less. And I don't mean that as a critique, it's just not what they do. And so it's a very, very big opportunity for not only you to make some income, for, but for you to actually help people who really need it. And to be involved in something where what you do can have a huge impact. It always feels good when what we do actually works well and has a big impact and local businesses is a place that you can do that. And so most, if you look at most local businesses, they are woefully behind when it comes to their web presence. As an example, I uh, have started working with a client recently and they didn't even have a Google business listing. So If you did a search for their exact name in the area where I live, it wouldn't show up. The little dot, they don't even have one. Now, that's absolutely huge for a local business because 
Even if I know the name of your business, I can't find you on the map. You just don't show up. So not only you're not getting new business from showing up in relevant searches, you're not even showing up for your own name. You're not even giving people who you've already earned the search from. You're not even getting those people. And so it's a huge, I mean, it was just a huge hole and very, very fundamental. Now, here's the thing about that. I mean, this this is basically like business suicide in this day and age to not have a listing in Google Maps. And, and the thing about it is, is it's not technical at all. It's filling out a form on Google. And then they send you a card to verify your address and you like enter the code. I mean, it takes all of about five minutes. I set it up for me. It literally took me about five minutes to do. So there's a lot and there's a lot of businesses out there that are just like this. And so for you, just having basic technical skill puts you way ahead conceptually. You may think you don't know that much, but just having some basic technical understanding, even of just how to use a computer. I mean, there's a lot of local business owners who just don't even really know how to use a computer that well. So just having those basic skills puts you way ahead conceptually. The other part of this is that a lot of local business owners tend to think that things that are not technical, things that are really more marketing and business, they think that they're technical. So a good example of this is Facebook remarketing. And this is something I'm a part of a local business group around here. That's actually where I get um, most of my local business clients. And, you know, at one meeting I talked about Facebook remarketing and the remarketing pixel that you put on your website and then you can advertise to people who visited your website on Facebook. Well, <laughs> you talk about that and it, it and they automatically assume it's something really technical that they wouldn't know how to do. When the reality of it is it's really just taking a code that Facebook gives you and and plopping it in where they tell you on your website. I mean, it's copying and pasting it's really nothing to it. But because it involves just that little bit of code, then they think the whole thing is technical. That and the fact that when you go and create ads, there's an interface that you got to use. This is the thing that I think a lot of developers miss. Having to use a, a t- online tool, most non-technical people consider that technical. Right? It doesn't have to involve using code. It's like WordPress. Knowing how to create posts and install plugins. To me and you, that doesn't really seem technical. But to most people, that is technical. And if you know how to do that, that's technical skill and you're a developer. Now, (laughs) again, you and I probably would beg to differ. But that's that's the way it is. So because, say, for example, Facebook, the back end of Facebook ads is an interface and there's analytics. And so there's numbers and there's, you know, percentage... (laughs) It's just, oh, the whole thing's technical. I can't do that. So they think th- certain things that aren't really technical are technical. And the most important thing about this is that you're not scared of it. And they are. You believe that you can tackle technical issues. You can learn the interface and the numbers and so forth. And they don't even want to mess with it. And so that creates a huge opportunity for you to fill a need. I mean, most of these people do well that they have no problem hiring somebody to do it. And so you can, again, earn an income and help them a ton by just doing some simple and basic things that you probably already know how to do. Again, as an example, one of my recent local business clients is a different one, but They're now on the first page of Google for the majority of their keyword terms for people that search for that kind of thing in this area. They're on the first page of Google and actually number one in a lot of those. And you want to know what the huge strategy we, we use to do that? One, I rebuilt their website. They were using GoDaddy Site Builder. I rebuilt their website, but... We put up one blog post. I put up one blog post probably 
eight or nine months ago. And we've been promoting that one blog post using remark Facebook remarketing for eight or nine months and just getting people to like it. And so every time you get more likes, those are, that's a signal for search engines. And so we've just consistently seen over time as that one blog post gets uh, more likes, more social authority, the overall site has just slowly risen in the search engines to where it's now on the first page and number one overall. I set that up in about 10 minutes. And the owner actually had a medical emergency in in the, that time period where there was probably a good four or five months where we didn't do anything with the site because he, he just couldn't. Uh, he couldn't take on new business or anything. But yet, just having that one ad running consistently has built his search engine rankings over time. Very simple, basic thing to do and made a huge difference. I mean, his sales this year uh, probably have already matched his total sales from last year in terms of revenue. I don't, I, I don't know, but I know how happy he is. <laughs> so uh, it, you can do some very, very simple things and have a huge impact for local businesses. So it's a huge opportunity. You probably already know enough to be able to do this. So what are some ideas? What are some things that you can do? Well, one I see quite a bit that I think you could set up in a, maybe a day is to create a brand, what we call a branding package. So, uh, and and maybe set up several of them, but it's basically you offer them a website, business cards, a letterhead, and then maybe like a Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube cover art. You offer just those simple things, website, business cards, letterhead, and some cover art for their social media uh, profiles that all have the same kind of look and feel. They all go together. It's a consistent brand. That's the idea behind it is that everywhere someone goes, they see a consistent brand identity. And you can set up and create those packages. And here's the thing. You can go out and find templates. In fact, johnmorrisonline.com slash 65. I emailed my mailing list. If you're not on my mailing list, highly recommend get on it. johnmorrisonline.com. You'll see it right at the top. I emailed this out to my mailing list a, a few days ago and people were just like, oh, this is so awesome. And it was these templates, 50 plus templates for that are basically PSDs, Photoshop files, for business cards. And it's just 50 different kind of templates that you can download and use. It's already out there. <laughs> and the only thing that you have to do is know how to use Photoshop to do some small edits. Now, I looked this up because one of my clients want, said they they ran out of business cards and they really kind of wanted to redo them and they wanted to see some designs. So I did some search around. I found this and I found one I really liked. I downloaded it. I edited it in about 10 minutes and sent it to them and they were over the moon about it. It was way better than the ones they had. I could just look at them and tell you that. But even they agreed. They're like, wow, these are awesome. Yes, let's do this. 10 minutes. So all this stuff is out there, website templates, business cards, you know, letterheads, etc. And you can kind of create a package where they're all consistent with each other and offer that. Simple. Or you could offer the remarketing services that I just talked about with Facebook or Pinterest or Twitter, they or YouTube, they all really kind of have them. Google AdWords. These remarketing services that Will people who visit their site or watch their YouTube videos, you can run ads to those people to bring them back. Very, very effective and super simple to set up. And the fact that you know how to install the Pixel, here's the secret to this. The fact that you go from marketing to cold traffic to marketing to remarketing to people who've already visited your website, the the value that they're going to get from that will just automatically be better. If you, if you do it right, if you do content marketing, really, they'll get more results from it because it's not cold traffic. It's just automatic. You almost can't lose. So you don't have to be a great ad writer. You just know how to need to know how to install the pixel on their website, which I imagine you could figure out. 
The other thing you could do is offer things like local marketing services. So you could offer to get them listed on Google Maps or Bing and Yahoo. And no, not that slimy kind. I get these messages all the time about my website that says, we've got a number one position for you on Google. That's misleading because we all know that you can't guarantee that. That's not what I'm saying. You can say, hey, I can just, I can make sure that when people Google your business, <laughs> you actually have a listing on there that, to show up. You know, and you can find businesses who don't have that and say, hey, look, you could walk into the store and be like, look, if I search for you on my phone, you don't come up. Your listing, I can set it up so that you at least show up, that you have a listing on there now. So people can find you and I'll charge you a hundred bucks for it or 50 bucks or whatever you feel comfortable with. And it would take you 10 minutes. So <laughs> very, very simple. And of course, you know, you obviously are a creative person, so you can get creative with this. There's lots of other things that you could figure out to do. In fact, I'm seriously considering putting a, together a course for you guys where I show you what I've been learning from doing local marketing as a developer and how I've been, you know, how this whole thing that people think things are technical that really aren't is really kind of the key to all of this. And so how you can position yourself as a developer and get people to hire you to do things that are really marketing and business related. So uh, this is when I talk about earlier about maybe creating a Udemy course, this is what I'm thinking about doing. But regardless, there's so many things that you can do. And there's so many local businesses out there that just need the help because everybody is on the internet. Everybody's on their phone. And a lot of these businesses just aren't doing a good job of getting themselves out there. And it's killing them. It's killing them. So it's it's not just an opportunity for you. Again, you can really help these people. You could save a business or more by what you probably already know right now. So huge opportunity. If you haven't thought about it before, I highly, highly recommend doing that. All right, coming up next in the show, we're going to get into our Q&A where I'm going to answer the questions that you have asked me. So if you've asked me a question over this last week or, or before, then you want to pay attention to the next segment because I may be answering it coming up. You're listening to John Morris Show and johnmorrisonline.com. Hey, quick question for you. Are you running a WordPress site? If so, then I want to recommend to you the premium WordPress hosting service, WP Engine. Now, what makes WP Engine different than a lot of web hosts out there is that it's designed specifically for WordPress with advanced caching and security implementation to keep your WordPress website up and running and running as fast as possible. And we all know how important speed is on the web these days. So if you're running WordPress and you don't have WP Engine yet, be sure to give it a look. You can get their best price at johnmorrisonline.com slash WP Engine. Again, that's johnmorrisonline.com slash WP Engine, all one word. Check them out. You're going to love your WordPress hosting. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the John Morris Show. And it's time now for our Q&A of the week where I answer your questions. Now, these are questions I received via email, over on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and so forth. Now, if you have a question you'd like for me to answer on the show, you can shoot me an email, john at johnmorrisonline.com. You can tweet me over on Twitter at JP Morris, over on Facebook at facebook.com slash johnmorrisonline, or on YouTube at youtube.com slash johnmorrisvideo. All right, let's dive into the question. So the first one is, what do you do for a great offer to your customers, what is important and what is not? What is a structure to adopt? So, you know, there's a lot of things that you can talk about. I mean, if you look at marketing information and copywriting and so forth, there's a whole ton of things uh, that go into that. So, I mean, I could go on for two hours or more about this question, but to kind of keep it succinct, I want to give you some of the most important things. So in terms of talking about a great offer, the most important thing is that you really get inside the mind of your customer 
and understand on an emotional level what it is that they really want. Now, as soon as I say that, there's a lot of things that come up for people. And some of those things can be true, and oftentimes a lot of those things are are maybe false. And so I want to just be a little bit more clear about what I mean by that. And so this is a, l- a, a touch technical in terms of getting I- inside someone's psyche, but I think it's important. So the way I always look at it is with anybody, people have two things that that they tend to focus on. So we're all value driven. Right. So we're all looking to increase the value that we have in our lives. So values can be both concrete and abstract. So they could be, you know, say a a new car is a concrete value. That's something that's a value to us that's concrete, physical. You can touch it. Whereas something like love is something that's more intangible. You can't really touch it or or point to it necessarily, but we all kind of know what it is and what it feels like. And it is something that we're all after. So you have. Uh, concrete or tangible and intangible uh, values. Now, what most often happens is that people focus on the concrete values, but what they really want are the intangible or the abstract values. So for example, with a car, we all, when we talk about wanting a car, we talk about all its features, we talk about all the things that it can do, all the physical aspects of it. But what we really want are are the abstract parts of it. So, for example, the base value of a car is the fact that I don't have to walk. It's the effort and the time that I save. Now, effort and time are things that aren't necessarily things you can touch and point to and quantify, but they're very, very real. So that's the base value of a car. There's also, you know, if you get a really nice car, there's the pride that you have from being able to afford that car or the social status that you feel like you might gain from driving around that car and people seeing you in it. These are all abstract things that you can't bottle up and put in a bottle. But when it comes to a car, they're the things that we really want. And so these are what we refer to as ends values and means values. Means values are something that's a means to an end. So a car is a means to the end of saving us effort, saving us time, making us feel proud, giving us social status, etc. So when I say you need to understand what your customers really want, you need to understand both. You need to understand the ends values and what they're really after on an emotional abstract level, but you also need to understand the means part of it and what they're focused on and how they translate the physical aspects of something into the the ends values how because there's certain features of a car that if a car doesn't have for example that they will not feel that they're going to get the ends value that they're after so if a car is an older car and it's all rusted on the outside well maybe they're not going to get the pride from driving around in that car. Maybe it'll actually be the opposite. Maybe they're not going to get the social status. So the features of the means value, the object matter in terms of translating those into the ends values that they're after. So again, understand those ends values and then really figure out how they're translated back into the actual physical aspects of the thing that you're providing. So it depends when you say, how do you write a good offer for your customers? It depends what, what that is. You know, if, it's, if you're talking about web design development services, that's one thing. But if you're talking about maybe some app you're going to create, or maybe you're talking about getting hired at a job. So it really kind of depends exactly what you're, you're talking about. But I can tell you when it comes to web design and web development services specifically, the ends values that people are after they're after security, right? Someone, they don't have to worry about their site and, um, you know, there being technical things wrong and so forth. Uh, the word, along with that is peace of mind. You know, again, they don't have to worry about it. Uh, it's just going to, they have someone who knows what they're doing is going to take care of it. It's also effort, putting in all the effort and headache and to, to not only build it, but learn how to do all that stuff. Uh, and maybe they'll miss something and so forth. Uh, and so th- there's there's a number of different ends values out there for web design and web de- development services that 
you know, when you kind of translate that back to what you're saying, you need to integrate those into your offer. And this is why I talk all the time about don't focus on what languages you know. That doesn't translate into ends values for clients because they really don't know what those things mean. You need to talk about the ultimate end product you're going to deliver and mostly about the way you're going to deliver it and the experience they will have because that's what they're concerned about. They're concerned if you're going to be on time. They're concerned if you know what you're doing. They're concerned if you're going to be reliable. They're concerned if you're going to communicate. Those are the things that they're worried about. So you need to translate those back into your services. All right, so (laughs) we'll kind of end it there with question number one. There's a lot I could go on and on and on about this stuff. But again, means values and how they translate into ends values because ends values are ultimately what people want. All right, next question starts off, this video is awesome. I've learned a lot of stuff from this video, but I'd like to ask one question. My passion is develop business applications for small businesses. I want to build my own software company. Could you please guide me how I should start it? Should I start a job first? What should I do now? So in terms of web design, web development, understand first off that this is a fairly general question. So I can really only give you a general answer. Um, I do like to try to be specific, but again, uh, this is kind of a broad, big picture question. So I'm going to have to answer it in that way. So the first thing is, is if your passion is to develop business applications for small businesses, then you just need to start doing that and let the rest of it kind of take care of itself. Now, here's an example of what I mean. You know, when I uh, started wanting to get into helping local businesses more, you know, I I didn't sit back and create a grand strategy because I'd kind of been through this enough to know that that's kind of a fool's game. You'll make a strategy, but oftentimes you really don't know what you're doing until you dig into it. So if you if you want to create business applications for small businesses, you just need to start doing that, which is what I did. And I just started going to small businesses. And at first, I I didn't ask, I didn't charge. Now, you'll have to understand that it's hard for local small businesses or small businesses, even if you're not charging, to give you access to to help them. It's going to be hard enough at first if you don't have some sort of reputation built up in that industry because these are this is their baby. Oftentimes, these people have worked their butt off to create the business that they have, and there's been a few things. I know it's the same with me. There's been a few things that I found that work and I'm, you know, they're they're really attached to those things and they don't want to disrupt them because they don't have they haven't yet figured out the full broad scope to where they feel confident that they could make their business grow in any environment in any context, right? There's people in this world that can do that that have st- started multiple business, they know exactly how it works and they don't worry about a lot of this stuff. But most small business owners aren't that way. And so if you want to get into helping small businesses, you have to understand that the trust factor is even higher because uh, they probably don't see themselves as business experts yet. So again, what I did is I just started helping people and I did it for free and I did it in s- small ways that they would allow me. I did it as let it as comfortable as they were um, and what they would let me do. I did that and just focused on getting them results. And then Over time, as I've done that, then people have started to see, you know, those small business owners will start to talk to their friends because especially local small businesses, a lot of them, I mean, my, my brother owns uh, his own business. He's probably in six or seven different small business groups, meetup groups in this area. They talk a lot. So all you got to do is get in there and start helping one and if you actually do a good job of helping them, they'll talk and eventually people will start to hire you. And that's exactly what ha- happened with me when I started doing that. You know, people started to talk, talk about the success they had with the stuff that I did. And next thing you know, somebody else wants me to do it. And then that person is willing to pay and so forth. So really, you just need to get in there and start helping them. So if you want to build business applications for small businesses, you need to actually go to a small business and try and figure out what are the problems what what kind of application would actually help them and then actually work with one and start building an application and, and find something that actually is very, very helpful. And once you do that, 
you're going to understand what you should do first, what you should do second, what you should do third. So that's my suggestion. Now, in terms of should I start a job first? Look, it's always better to be in a position where you have money and you can do, you know, you can start a business or pursue a passion um, in conjunction with that. So what I mean is it's not a good idea to be broke and trying to do this because you're always going to be focused on money. So if you need to start a job doing something else that's maybe related but not exactly right, exactly close to what you're passionate about, go ahead and do that because it's a better mind space to be in. Just make sure that you don't get too comfortable because it's easy, especially if you start making a lot of money, which developers can do very easily, it's easy to get comfortable. So you, that's the thing that you'll have to focus on, but it's much better to pursue something when you're in a kind of financially stable state of mind because then you won't make short-sighted short-term decisions because you you need money you'll actually be able to think long-term and strategically all right next question i'm 32 year olds and i want to know if that could be an obstacle for getting hired as a fresh developer i graduated in 2014 and i'm currently pursuing my master's degree so i have no industrial experience the simple answer is no I mean, I'm 34, about to turn 35, and I've never had a single client ask me about my age. Now, if you're going to apply at a big company, you know, an IBM or a Google or something like that, you know, maybe they look at that. You, you maybe not be able to, might not be able to do the internships as well, and 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 so forth. But you know, I can, my little brother has gone that route. I, I haven't gone the big company route, but my little brother has. And I think he was, I mean, 30, 31 when he got hired at IBM, which is the initial company he got hired for. He doesn't work for them anymore, but he got hired at IBM at 31 years old. So even those, they don't care uh, that much. What they, what they care about is your talent level you know, if you're responsible, really, you kind of have an advantage at 32 years old, because people just automatically associate age with responsibility. And that's doesn't, that's not always true. And hopefully you are responsible, but that tends to be people's automatic assumption. So you can play on that. You can say, look, I'm not some kid just right out of high school who's never lived life. You know, I can I've been around, I've been in the workforce, I understand what it takes to be responsible and deliver on time. This is what Again, this is what I always say. Clients, bosses, they care more about reliability, communication, someone who's mentally and emotionally stable, etc. Those are the things that they care about more than your talent level because they know they can teach you the stuff that they need to teach you talent-wise. So the age factor actually plays to your advantage in that scenario. So no, I don't I don't think it affects you at all. And if anything, it can give you a little bit of an advantage if, if you play it right. So make sure if you're doing an interview and you're getting asked these questions about, you know, reliability and so forth, which ultimately almost always comes up, you say, you actually specifically explicitly say, look, you know, I'm not a kid. I'm 32. I'm an adult. Maybe you're married and have kids. I I don't know. But I've been around. I understand what it means. I love to code. That's why I changed careers and and went after this. And so, you know, I, 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 believe me, I get all that stuff in terms of reliability. You can really kind of ham that up a little bit. So that's what I would suggest. All right. So that'll wrap it up for the questions for this episode. That'll also wrap up this episode for the week. Now, if you liked it, be sure to like it so that I know that you like this kind of content. If you know somebody would benefit from it, please share it with them. I'd really appreciate that helps bring more people into the podcast, which benefits us all. And if you haven't yet, well, then go ahead and subscribe. You can subscribe on iTunes at johnmorrisonline.com slash iTunes, on Android at johnmorrisonline.com slash SoundCloud, and on YouTube at johnmorrisonline.com slash YouTube. As I mentioned at the beginning, if you have questions, you can send them to me at john at johnmorrisonline.com. You can tweet me over on Twitter at jpmorris. Facebook, facebook.com slash John Morris online, or again on YouTube at John Morris online.com slash YouTube. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.
Hey everybody, here's a quick one for you. We all know how important creating blog content is to attract new clients to your web design business. But oftentimes those first few members of your audience can be difficult to get. Well, I want to help try and get you over that hump and help you get your first few followers. Now I have a, an audience of over 20,000 YouTube subscribers, email list subscribers, and roughly 30,000 visitors to my website each and every month. And I'd have no problem promoting your website to that audience and helping you get those first few visitors. Now to get the details on this, you'll have to head on over to johnmorrisonline.com slash publicity, but you'll need to do it before you actually start your blog. So head on over to johnmorrisonline.com slash publicity and let me help you get those first few visitors and those first few members of your audience.